Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best minds in the sport so you can train smarter, stay healthy, and run faster now. And now your host, Tina Muir. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. Thank you for taking the time to tune in today. I know you have a number of ways you could spend your time, so it really means a lot that you've chosen to listen. Sometimes you talk to someone whose passion just shines through through their words. This was definitely the case with today's guest. He was incredibly knowledgeable about the evolution of running and explained just why we're so good at running as human beings, despite what some people think. Usually we as runners are referred to as the crazy ones, especially those of us who are marathon and ultra marathoners. But our guest today explains how those who are not running are actually the crazy ones and how our bodies have evolved over the years to be great endurance runners. You know we like to think of ourselves as the running resource without the fluff, and that is exactly what this podcast is. We go into detail and give you something to really think about, rather than just going over the same topics over and over. Today, our guest is Dan Lieberman, also known as the Barefoot Professor. He is the Professor of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University, and also the Chair of the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard. Dan won the parody, um, the IG Nobel Prize in 2009, which is a parody of the Nobel Prize for unusual or trivial achievements in scientific research. It's an honor that makes people laugh or really makes them think. You'll see that Dan is a, a great guest and has a great sense of humor. Dan has also written four books, the most recent of which is The Story of the Human Body, Evolution, Health and Disease. And he has written many articles over the last 20 years, focusing on things from minimal, minimal shoes, foot strike patterns, barefoot running, the evolution of marathon running, and more. Today, we're going to cover how humans are actually as efficient as other running mammals, and in some ways, better than other man- mammals. How running played a major role in human evolution. How hunter-gatherers were not actually as healthy as we think they are, and how they spent a lot of their time sitting. Why the best place to run at barefoot is actually on the cement outside your house. How running faster forces you to run with better form and how you can use this to reduce overstriding. And the difference in culture between Kenya and the Western world and how that sets them apart from the rest of the world, especially in marathon racing. So that's enough from me. Let's get on with the interview and meet Dan. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. We're excited to have you. So you have quite an accomplished list of articles that you have written, and um, you've written four books over the years. What is it about running that interests you in particular? Um, Well, I think um, um, I got interested in running because um, um, I've always loved uh, (coughs) I've always loved running, but. um, um, I, running is often uh, treated by uh, people in human evolutionary biology as kind of an odd thing that people do today. And I always felt that uh, that didn't make any sense because obviously people are extraordinary at running. We're just not good at sprinting. We're, mm-hmm. we're, we're really, uh, compared to other animals, really good at long distance running. And um, so that idea sort of bubbled around in my head for years. Um, and it wasn't until I uh, started to do some research on how we keep our heads still when we run, that, um, that it became clear to me, um, um, in conjunction with the collaboration with Dennis Bramble at University of Utah, um, that uh, indeed uh, there's evidence for strong selection for our abilities to run in human evolution, and, that, um, and these help explain uh, why people like uh, me and you, and presumably people listening to this broadcast, are, um, aren't crazy, we're not <laughs> freaks, we're not strange, we're actually doing what we evolved to do, and um, and actually, it's the folks out there who don't run very much who are the, the strange freaks and the and the abnormal human beings. And so, um, that's really what has motivated me. And then, of course, I'm also become interested in um, how and why running uh, promotes health, um, and also how to uh, run in a way that um, that keeps runners healthy, uh, because that's a you know we all know that injuries are is a serious concern for running. And if we evolve to run, why do so many runners get injured? Yeah, that's interesting. And we're going to go into that a little bit later. So could you tell us um, about your research about the role of long distance running in the way we have evolved to be 
uh, great endurance runners? I mean, you talked about that a little, little bit just there, but if you could explain more. Well, um, what happened was, um, I'll, I'll tell the story, really. So mm -hmm. um, in, um, <clears throat> when I was in graduate school, I read a paper by Dave Carrier, um, which was published in 1984, I believe, um, and arguing that humans, uh, which looked at thermoregulation and basically made the, the point that humans are incredibly good at thermoregulating when running. And he made the suggestion that, that, that humans evolved to do long distance running. And it was in a journal called Current Anthropology, which has a little section after it where people can write, where professors, important people, write in and, and make their comments. And, and everybody thought the paper who wrote in more or less um, um, disagreed with the paper. They said it was just ridiculous. Humans aren't really good at running. We're slow. We're awkward, etc. They completely discounted it. And I remember reading it thinking, no, it's a brilliant idea. Um, but I wasn't working on running at the time. I, 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 I was working on, on heads. I'm a head guy back, actually, in my in terms of my original training, and um, but um, but the idea. I remember having an argument with a professor of mine, a very famous guy, um, who did a lot of work on comparative locomotion and physiology. Published a lot of really major papers, and I remember him also thinking the paper was just ridiculous. You know, because the standard story is that humans are slow, we're awkward, we're in, we're uh, we're, we're inefficient, um, and so uh, from a performance perspective, we're just not very good runners. So how could you possibly argue that humans are evolved to run? Um, but it didn't make sense to me, and I kind of put it in the back of my brain, and then many years later started getting involved in the issue of head stabilization. And we realized that there are some really interesting mechanisms that you could actually see in the fossil record that appeared two million years ago, which are help us stabilize our heads, um, and which only make sense for running. They don't make sense for walking. And this was work that I was doing with Dennis Bramble at the University of Utah, who was the advisor of the famous Dave Carrier, who wrote that first paper. And Bramble was also convinced by this argument. So we started, uh, and Bramble had been thinking about this for a while, so we started working on this. And slowly, slowly over the years, we did more research and kept talking about it and kept sending emails back and forth. And eventually we spent, we wrote a, we wrote a paper, which was in the journal Nature. It came out in 2004, entitled Born to Run, with the cover article of, of Nature, which is a big deal. And um, in that paper, we outlined all the adaptations that we could see in human beings that make us really good at, run, good at running and when, when they first appear, uh, when's, when's the evidence for their first appearing. And, it's, and a lot of them show up around two million years ago. And when the, when the genus Homo evolves, particularly a species called Homo erectus, which is also when we started hunting. And so we kind of took Carrier's story and kind of flushed it out and took it further and put it into an exact time and place and made the argument that it had to do with scavenging and then hunting around two million years ago and and kind of kind of put the whole picture together and, um, and, um, and wrote this paper called um, uh, the evolution of endurance running in the genus homo and um, and the title on nature was born to run and that's how that's how it really got started and, and you know as we were writing the paper we kept sending emails to each other um, like are we crazy how come anybody how come nobody's published this before and you know long Achilles tendons and large, large gluteus maximuses and, and large semicircular canals that measure head pitching and, and you know the list goes on. There are lots and lots of features that we have that appear around two million years ago that apes don't have, that earlier hominins don't have um, and uh, you know maybe one or two okay you might argue coincidence but when you have that many um, um, and you also look carefully at how good humans are yes we're slow Yes, we're uh, somewhat awkward, um, but we're not actually inefficient. The data are that humans are actually, when you correct for body mass, humans are actually as efficient as, as other great running animals, like, like uh, dogs and, and, uh, and horses. Um, so, um, so altogether, and of course we're better at running in, in, in the heat than any other animal, and you start looking at the ethnographic data, altogether I think it's a compelling argument that... Um, that we that running played a major role in human evolution, and and we have all these features that make us really good at it. And anybody who's run a marathon, you know, and watches the fact that it's not just you know elite athletes running. Your average everyday people can can run twenty six point two miles, and and our dogs can't do it. Um, it's not the speeds that we do it. Um, it's something that that's part of being a human being. It's mm -hmm. it's intrinsic to who we are, in, in many fundamental ways. 
Yeah, that's a great point you bring up, and it m- makes me kind of think about how um, if you are training, you've never run before in your life, and you decide you want to run a 5K, you know, 5K seems like a really long way, and uh, to people who don't run, it is, and it's an accomplishment to be proud of, but then you get that next uh, excitement of, oh, I want to try a 10K and a half marathon, and we continue to adapt with surprising ease to the point where you can you can run a marathon, and that would make sense with what you were saying about it's in there and a lot of people don't use it the way it should be used and you know overeat and under exercise but it's good to hear that yeah well I think um, you know a lot of people are just astonishingly out of touch with their bodies Mm -hmm. they don't really understand how their bodies work and how athletic just the average everyday average human being is and we and I think one of the problems is that we tend to focus too much on elite athletes Um, um, and yes elite athletes are astonishing but you know we didn't evolve to stand on one line and run 26.2 miles as fast as possible to another line, right? And do it in two hours. Uh, the fact that some people can do it is remarkable, but that's that's actually an abnormal thing to do. What we did evolve to do was run maybe 15 kilometers, also walk some, because um, we did it while we were tracking and hunting. Uh, we didn't evolve to do it at really high speeds. And so we tend to kind of make it harder for ourselves, you know, trying to qualify for Boston or trying to compare ourselves to, you know, Paula Radcliffe or Haile Gebri Selassie or whatever. But actually, um, I think the achievements of average everyday runners are remarkable. I mean, um, uh, I love after in a marathon going watching, you know, after I finish. Sometimes I like to go and watch other people finish, and just seeing, you know, people finishing a marathon for the first time, uh, how happy they are. Now, don't tell me that. That, that we are you know that, that this is a horrible thing these people look elated and delighted and and they've accomplished something wonderful and and uh, to tell them that they're freaks is just preposterous yeah no I agree and it, there's a quote I can't remember what it is right now but it's about um you know if you want to see the ultimate human spirit go watch the end of a marathon and it's true yeah it's true yeah I completely agree (laughs) so no that's that's interesting to think about and um what would you say then to all the recent uh articles and information that's coming out about you know sitting is killing us and we don't have any you said about the gluteus maximus and how that has uh, adapted us um how we don't have any anymore and um, we're you know killing ourselves and it doesn't matter how much you run because if you sit around all day it you're you know reversing the effects but what what are your thoughts on on that information gosh well that's a complicated Pandora's <laughs> box that you've just raised and um, um, we need to be clear about one thing yes we did evolve to run but we also evolved to sit around a lot too um, one of the misconceptions that people have about applying evolution to health is that um, that we evolved to be healthy, and that's not true. I said we evolved to run, but that doesn't mean that everything that we evolved to do uh, benefits health, because um, natural selection only cares about health to the extent that health promotes reproductive success. So there's all kinds of things in our bodies that we're selected for that don't actually promote health. Uh, high levels of testosterone in males, for example, are, are not definitely not good for us, right? Um, but they um, but they um, um, but they increase reproductive success. Uh, the list goes on. So uh, yes, we evolved to run, but we never evolved to uh, run when we didn't have to. And uh, hunter gatherers, who are often at the margin of energy balance, I mean, they struggle to get enough energy to 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 to, to survive. Uh, if you ever go hang out with hunter gatherers, you'll see that when they're not uh, off foraging, they're sitting around. Um, so yes, there are health cons- consequences to sitting all day long. There's no question about it. Um, to what extent that's because sitting is bad for you intrinsically, or because sitting is bad when you have a high carbohydrate diet, and uh, you know it's all very complicated. Um, but we're we're complex creatures that um, that are jumbles of adaptations. That are that are often in conflict and not always good for us. And um, the fact of the matter, though, is that uh, there's no question that phys- physical activity, regular physical activity, is strongly beneficial for almost every system of the body. Um, that large amounts of physical inactivity are also bad for us. Sitting around a lot, no question that it has has consequences. Um, and um, 
And it's complicated. There's just no way around it. Do you think it's almost a case of we always want something to maybe not complain about, but something to talk about? And, you know, you've you've said yourself about how uh, at the end of the day we um, adapt and evolution, its primary focus is for rep- reproduction and natural selection, but it's almost as if we're trying so hard to make ourselves the perfect human being that there is no such thing and we're always kind of looking for something to blame as to why we aren't perfect. <laughs> well, that's correct. I mean, it's um, everything has trade-offs. There's no such thing as a, a behavior that has no trade-off. So whenever you see uh, you know, the perfect diet, the optimal diet, the perfect health, you know, um, but the perfect physical activity, you know, that's all, it doesn't make any sense to me as an evolutionary biologist. There is no perfect this or perfect that. Um, everything has compromises and we all have to make, you know, choices about what we're, what we're uh, trading off. And, um, um, you know, the idea, for example, that, um, that uh, if, you know, running can only be good for you because we evolved to run is interesting because, you know, um, there are, again, trade-offs, right? There are going to be costs to running, just as there are benefits. There's no, there's no free lunch ever in, in biology. Um, that said, the balance of the evidence is clear that, that, you know, regular physical activity is good for you and regular physical inactivity is bad for you. But, you know, there are vigorous debates out there. For example, to what extent does um, too much running um, damage the heart? Um, uh, I'm not too persuaded by some of the evidence, but um, but there's certainly a, a, an important debate going on, and, and we'll have to see. I mean, there may be, uh, again, trade-offs for all kinds of systems of the body, and, um, and, and runners should realize there's no magic bullet that doesn't exist. Yep, good point, definitely. So let's switch topics a little bit, and uh, can you explain another area that is uh, often confused within the running world? Um, You have done a lot of uh, focusing on um, barefoot running and um, how that is, and can you explain how that is different to using just a minimalist shoes? And a a lot of people confuse those thinking, you know, I'm doing the same thing by running in a minimalist shoe compared to barefoot running. Could you explain that? (laughs) Well, um, yeah, I I have to say that when when we started doing work on barefoot running, which was soon after we published that paper in, in Nature in 2004, uh, I, um, you know, I had, the only reason I studied is that if we evolved to run, we obviously evolved to run barefoot. And I was, and all, you know, I realized that all the data that had been published about running had been published on, you know, shod humans, or when they did look at barefoot running, they looked at, you know, college students asked to take their shoes off, basically. So, um, I was just curious about it. And we started getting some barefoot runners in the, in the lab to, to look at how they ran. And, um, and um, before I answer your question, I just want to, I say as a preface, as a preamble almost, that um, I I had no idea that the way in which people would respond to all this uh, research, um, uh, part of that was because it was hyped by the book, uh, the book Born to Run, which, you know, was started by the research that we did, but yeah. um, um, but but also because um, uh, people are, are strangely and abnormally emotional, emotional about this topic in a way that I never imagined. So you raised a good point. The first is that there's been a strange confusion of barefoot running with minimal running, minimal shoe running, and um, and it, and part of that's been been um, I think pushed along by by advertisers and shoe companies um, calling their shoes barefoot, which is an obvious oxymoron. Uh, a shoe cannot be barefoot if you're wearing a shoe, even if it's a minimal shoe. It's this is nonsense. Um, and furthermore, um, it's pretty clear that even a minimal shoe has effects on how you run. So so. And secondly, people want to kind of typecast everybody, right? You know, um, in addition to ascribing, you know, you're, uh, you know, you're female and I'm male, and you know, I'm American and you're British, and etc. You know, you're a forefoot striker and I'm a rear foot striker, and you're a this and I'm a that. It's kind of funny because humans are actually very variable. So it's true that for the most part, most people when they take their shoes off and run on a hard surface, land on the ball of the foot. They become midfoot or forefoot strikers. But I can tell you that barefoot runners sometimes land on their heels. And there are plenty of people who are shod who also are forefoot strikers. In fact, most of the world's best runners are forefoot strikers. Um, so it's incredibly variable. And barefoot runners, in fact, we've, we've, we've submitted a paper, which is under review, showing that barefoot runners tend to be much more variable in how they run than shod runners. 
So when you say sense. sorry, when you say shod runners, is that just? Could you explain <coughs> what that? Means? People who wear shoes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, because um, when you take your shoes off, all of a sudden you get lots more information about the world out there. And when it's really hard, you probably start landing on the ball of your foot. When it's soft, you might be more likely to land on your heel if you like to land on your heel, or if you're tired, or or whatever. Um, so um, shoes have changed many aspects of how we run. Um, they change how our foot functions to some extent. They lessen the amount of work that our foot does. They change the angle of the foot when it hits the ground. Um, it removes sensory information. So, so barefoot running is, can be the same as shod running in many respects, but it also can be different. And there's no, again, no simple answer. There's never, and we never ever said there was. So, for example, that original paper we published in Nature in 2010, we never said all barefoot runners are four-foot strikers. We pointed out that of the population that we studied, a, a high percentage of them were landing on the ball of their foot. And, but we also pointed out that they sometimes were midfoot strikers and sometimes were rearfoot strikers. And we put the percentages in that paper. But when it got reported by the press, it suddenly became all barefoot runners are always four-foot strikers. Which, you know, it's funny. When you put something in a paper, you never... It's hard to predict how people will, will, will turn that into some nonsense, right? And then, and then we, we didn't say that, that four-foot striking is better for you. We said we, we pointed out that since four foot strikers don't cause don't get that big impact peak when you hit the ground, so it's more it's a more gentle form of landing. That that might you know that makes sense because it doesn't hurt as much to rear foot strike uh, on a soft surface than a hard surface, and on a hard surface it doesn't hurt as much to four foot strike than to rear foot strike. That's like that's not very controversial actually, <laughs> right? And and we said well that might be related to injury because after all impacts hurt and. Impacts are rapid rates of loading. If I were to reach through the space and, and actually punch you right now, right? If I were to punch you really slowly versus really hard with the same amount of force, which would hurt you more? The fast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so why would it be any different for the foot on the ground? But there's a big argument about this, and there are people who actually argue that impact peaks, rapid high rates of loading, which hurt, don't cause injury. I don't believe that. I think it's a crazy argument. Um, most of the data come from people only wearing shoes in the first place. Uh, there's lots of reason to be deeply skeptical about that argument, but it's an argument going on, and science will, will address it slowly, marching on, etc. Um, I find it almost you know, interesting maybe even having that argument, but there we are. The argument is out there. because, um, But nonetheless, we, that's all we said, and yet it's turned into this big, you know, People use it, use it in all kinds of interesting ways, including the barefoot community as well as the, you know, the and the who are, you know, it's the other thing that's interesting is that, uh, uh, you know, people tend to polarize views, right? So there's you know this kind of barefoot enthusiast community which thinks that anybody who wears a shoe is somehow sort of evil and a capitalist tool and there's like something wrong with them, and then there are people out there who think that anybody who takes their shoes off are, you know, is dangerous and crazy and stupid. Um, the fact of the matter is there's nothing abnormal about being barefoot. Um, but people have been wearing shoes for a long time. And if people want to wear shoes, they should wear shoes. And if they want to go barefoot, they should go barefoot. If they want to go barefoot on Monday and go wear shoes on Tuesday, what's the problem with that? The important point is to help people do it healthily and not injure themselves and not pretend that these are panaceas um, and that you know, you're know you going to solve all your problems by wearing this shoe or not wearing a shoe or whatever. None of these things uh, make any sense to me. And yet... The arguments that have been made, um, um, none of which I've made, are quite extraordinary. And, um, and I just have to, I'm, I'm just sort of astonished by the whole thing. So do you think it's kind of what you talked about, about the polar opposites, that people just did a little bit too soon, uh, too much too soon, kind of jumped in with both feet? Uh, well, some <laughs> so people speak, did, like, sure. Just too, too much of it, um, just deciding, I'm going to do it, I'm going to be barefoot, I'm going to run everything barefoot, and, you know, their bodies just weren't used to it and weren't able to handle it without adapting slowly over time. Sure, of course. I mean, there were a lot, I mean, I've seen it, I, I, I teach college students, right, and I've seen some of them get really excited and they just go off and run 10 miles barefoot, which is crazy, right? You have to adapt your body to it, just as if you were to start, you know, lifting weights, you have to, you know, you can't just suddenly start lifting 500 pounds, you have to build up to it, right? You can't just suddenly become a barefoot runner if you've been wearing shoes your whole life. Everybody has always said this, but people are, you know, strange. They faddish. I mean, who knows why they they, they, they behave so 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 that way? But they have. 
Um, but from the other perspective, there are also people saying, oh my God, there are all these barefoot people going out, getting out there and they're getting, they're taking off their shoes, they're getting injured, um, you know, uh, this is wrong. But they're kind of forgetting that there are all those people wearing shoes out there who are also regularly yeah. getting injured. I mean, orthopedics, doctors of orthopedics and podiatrists, their offices are full of injured, shod people, but they're kind of like car accident victims. We, we kind of just accept that there's going to be a certain rate of runners who are injured every year wearing shoes. All of a sudden, now we have barefoot runners getting injured, and people are all in a you know alarm about it. There's no evidence that they're getting injured at a higher rate than shod runners. In fact, this recent issue of Journal of Sports and Health Sciences suggests that a lot of them aren't getting it. They, they may actually be getting injured at a slightly lower rate. We don't know yet. There's not enough, enough data. So, you know, let's step back from the hype and actually look at the data and think sensibly about it. You know, again, as I said, there's nothing abnormal about running barefoot. I think you can learn a lot about how your body works and functions by running barefoot. There's nothing wrong with wearing a shoe, too. What matters is, I think, how you run, and shoes influence how you run. And um, I think that, that the important thing is to try to help people run better, and learning to run barefoot can teach us lessons um, that you can use whether you wear a shoe or not. And finally, the other most important thing is, you know, the reason most people run barefoot it's because it's fun. It feels good. And if people want to do it, let them do it. And if they don't want to do it, fine. But why are, why are people so judgmental about it? Most people are arguing and fulminating about it. I've never tried it. It's fun. It feels good. That's why, that's why I like to do it. it. It's a delightful feeling. When most people take their shoes off and start running barefoot, they get this big grin on their face because it, it's just like, just like taking your shoes off on the beach. It, it's delightful. Yeah. Uh, um, and if it's not delightful, don't do it. Yeah. So would you say that um, for most people, if they wanted to do, you know, some strides after a run that, you know, maybe not on the cement outside your house, but... No, that's the best place to do it, actually. On the cement, really? Absolutely. The best place to learn to run barefoot is to run on a hard, smooth surface. Okay. Because what you learn, again, this is something that, you know, people are so out of touch with their bodies, and I'm going to guess that you are too, yep. <laughs> that, that people are afraid to run on hard surfaces. But when you, when you run properly barefoot, it doesn't hurt, um, except when it's smooth. All you care about is texture. If there are pebbles, you know, or hypodermic needles, or something like that, yes, then it's going to hurt. But if it's a, if it's a smooth pavement, it's actually one of the nicest surfaces to run barefoot on. Absolutely. Okay. And people, if you have, if you don't know that, you should try it. Okay, I, I will give it a go. And actually, that reminds me. Um... We talked to uh, Matt Phillips, one of our writers for Runners Connect, a few weeks ago, and he was saying one of his uh, one of the things he tells uh, runners to do is uh, if they they usually listen to music, so they can't hear themselves running. So he'll tell them try and run quietly, and he said your body will find its most efficient way. There is no one you should land you should land on your heel, you should land on your midfoot, you. Um, should do a certain thing, your body will naturally find what it finds it is its own comfortable most position, and uh, you, your comfort should be a, a gauge in a lot of your choices when it comes to running. So that matches with what you said. That's probably true to some extent. I mean, uh, certainly, uh, good runners run quietly, and, and one of the and what that's telling you the reason that what, what's important about a quiet landing is that a quiet landing means you have no impact peak. Right? You're not slamming hard into the ground. And one of the things that you do when you run barefoot is you, dis you discover that it really hurts to slam <laughs> your foot into the ground. That's why we were, you know, the cover of Nature when we had the barefoot paper was entitled, you know, uh, Tread Softly, right? Because when you hit the ground barefoot, you, you land softly and gently, right? Um, that's the essence of barefoot running. Um, but it doesn't actually necessarily mean that you're running well that way because sometimes people can learn to run quietly and they might get away with it for a while, but it doesn't mean that they're actually running. They could be overstriding horribly or, you know, landing like a ballerina on their toes, etc. They might end up actually paying a price for it later on. So I think good running form is more than just being quiet. I think oh, there yeah. are other no, elements yeah, as definitely, well. But it's an important definitely. element of good running form. Mm -hmm. But it's the essence of barefoot running is landing gently and lightly. And that's, yeah. what, that's what shoes allow you to land in a way that you couldn't run barefoot. And my hypothesis is that we didn't evolve to run that way. We didn't evolve to crash into the ground mm -hmm. and, you know, use cushioning to help us do that. And people who do that, well, maybe they can get away with it, particularly if they're not doing huge amounts of miles, they're not going very fast. But once you start picking up the pace, once you start doing, putting in lots of miles, 
You know, that's when people start getting injured, and some of those injuries may be caused by crashing really hard into the ground. And um, and that's the ultimate thing you learn from barefoot running, to run lightly and gently. Yep, yep. Well, thank you for clearing that up. So let's. you mentioned overstriding a few times uh, in the last few minutes, so let's talk a bit more about that. Um, I've listened to some of your um, interviews before, and you talked about uh, overstriding being one of the biggest issues in runners. Um, so could you talk a bit more about how that how that can affect runners and what, what that does. Well, we're still studying overstriding. So I actually have a paper that I'm hoping to submit very soon. Um, but uh, overstriding is a complex term. It means different things to different people. Uh, so let's be clear about it. One definition of overstriding is how far your foot lands in front of your, your hips or your center of mass. So how far forward you're, you're landing. Um, and... Um, and we know that the further forward you land, the more braking force you put on your body. So then that means you decelerate your body for the first half of stance, which means you have to re-accelerate your body in the second half of stance to push yourself forward. So it's inefficient. When you land really far out in front, your leg tends to be stiffer, so the impact peak tends to be higher, so you tend to hit harder. Um, and there may be other biomechanical um, problems caused by landing really far out in front. Um, but you can't, unless you're, you know, a sprinter like, uh, you know, Usain Bolt or whatever, land with your foot right underneath your hip. That's very hard. Um, most of us who are running long distance do have to have a, a, a braking force. We do have to overstride in that regard. But um, if you watch the world's best runners, and this is still something we're working on, you'll notice that they land with their foot, their ankle, pretty much right below their knee. So when they, they, they stride, they, they get their extension, they get their leg they get their leg forward primarily with their hips, and they don't land with their 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 foot straight out way out in front of them. They they, they get good hip hip flexion, and they land with a kind of a vertical shank, a vertical tibia. And when they that, when they land, that means they're landing in a, in a less stiff fashion. They're still having some deceleration, of course, and that's necessary. But you're storing up elastic energy in your in your in the ligaments and tendons and maybe the muscles of your leg, and that helps push you back up again in the air. Um, and uh, so, so there are different kinds of overstriding, and my guess is that overstriding too much is, is a problem, but overstriding too much, particularly in terms of where your ankle is relative to your knee, is especially problematic. I think most good coaches know that, and they know that you know, runners shouldn't just throw their, you know, land with a really stiff, straight leg and not get hip extension. And, I, and, and, and why that is biomechanically is really interesting, and we've got uh, some interesting data on that, and hope to, hope to publish that soon. So, uh, so that's really a hypothesis at this point, but I think it's, um, you know, you talk to most coaches, they'll, you know, I don't think what I just said is at all controversial. Most yeah. coaches agree, you should flex your hips, right? Land with a kind of vertical tibia. And by the way, when you do that, tell me how your heel strike really hard. It's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, if you land with a vertical shank, you have to be doing something really kind of weird, to, unless you're, you know, to, to land, particularly if you're barefoot to land on your heel. So that's why most runners who have good running form, who are good runners, are kind of mid-foot strikers, right? Because they're, that's the way the foot is configured relative to the tibia, relative to the femur, you know, it's just, it just works out that way. So as you, as you try to improve your running form through moving your hips forward, I actually, uh, I went to a biomechanics uh, full body gait analysis with the force impact plates and everything, and I've been working myself on um, pulling my hips back under me uh, while I'm running and not overstriding, and um, exactly what you mentioned, trying to get that straight line down from your knee to your ankle to your foot. Um, and uh, how it's interesting what you just said about, um, you know, it's almost impossible to heel strike. I have noticed I'm landing more on my midfoot, so it is as you do improve your running form, you are going to move more towards the midfoot, but it isn't that you know, if you force your body to run on your midfoot, you're automatically going to have better running form. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So No, it doesn't. It's, it's, there's, <laughs> there's no, you can't just like do one thing and then poof, you've yeah. got like perfect running form. Yeah, I've anybody been learning that a lot. The case, anybody yeah. thinks that's the case is, uh, um, well, diluted. <laughs> so could you just uh, quickly explain the difference between when um, we may have confused some runners uh, with some of our articles in the past when you talk about, you know, we talk about how you should do strides after your run. But what mm. is the difference between doing a stride and, uh, you know, you're told to do a stride, which in, 
logically you would think that means you know you stretch out you um take a bigger step but how is could you explain how that is different to overstriding well i exactly i think i think of str- strides are wonderful right they're mm-hmm. particularly at the end of a run when you're tired kind of try to relax your body and run properly and run fast and it does force you i think to running better in fact one of the uh, as you know many runners know one of the things you learn is what you, when you when you, you know, everything's going to hell in a handbasket and you're having a rough time in a, you know in the marathon for example sometimes the best way to fix the problem is to speed up not to slow down because it actually forces you back into better running form and it's 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 counterintuitive but it works and i think that's sort of how strides work so so for me when i try to run strides at the end of a run i'm trying to really get good hip flexion not get stressed up i might i might be um, uh, you know, I'm not trying to stride out by overstriding. I'm simply trying to to get to to you know, speed is the is the is the product of stride rate times stride length. And I try to run at a pretty constant stride frequency. I tend to run around 172 to 176 steps a minute. Okay, <clears throat> and I don't try to when I when I run faster, I try not to increase that step frequency, but I increase my stride length. But by increasing my stride length, not by extending my knee and throwing my leg out, but by flexing my hip and getting a good, nice running form. And it's kind of like a, and then having my leg bounce back up properly, so like, almost like it hits my butt, right? Um, that's, to me, a good stride. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful stride. It's the way the world's best runners run. I mean, just get online and watch some of those slow-motion movies of you know, elite runners. There's a beautiful one um, on, uh, on YouTube of um, Jeffrey Mutai when he was finishing the Boston Marathon running down Beacon Street, um, it's on the flat, um, it's at the end, he's, you know, he's about to run the, f- the fastest marathon run at that point, um, and, you know, he's got, you know, that's the way to run, <laughs> and he's, you know, his, his, his knees are, are come up high, he lands with his, his tibia vertically, his foot is almost flat, it's just a slight four foot strike, his kick is beautiful, his posture is gorgeous, He's not clenched up, you know. He's not doing anything crazy with his hands, you know. He's just, he's in the groove. He's running, you know, um, 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 you know. He's running like a dream, you know. And most of us dream to run like that. And mm-hmm. uh, and and so to me, when I do strides, that's how I try. I try to think of like I want to run like that. I'm of course not that good a runner, <laughs> so it's a bit of a fantasy, but it's worth trying. I think a lot of it is like you just mentioned about also about being relaxed, you know, n- trying not to force things and when you try and do a certain thing and force it when your body isn't quite ready, that's when you're going to run into issues because it's you're stiffening up. And I noticed a lot with myself trying to change the form, I was actually like stiffening up which was making things hurt because my body was confused as to what I was trying to ask it to do. <laughs> oh yeah, now you got to be you know, being stiff as a runner is a bad thing. <laughs> yep, that's a good point. So actually, speaking of um, Jeffrey Mutai, which, by the way, I will put that um, a link to that uh, YouTube video on our show notes, which will be at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC47. So check that out. But um, you mentioned about Jeffrey Mutai, and um, you did do some work in Kenya, um, but what was the most interesting thing that you found about your research there with the runners, if you could pick one thing? Gosh, well, I've been working there for so long, it's <laughs> kind of hard to pick out one thing. I mean, we've just been interested in many aspects of, of running there. I mean, I think, um, actually, what's most interesting about Kenya is not, um, you know, the the measurements we've taken, etc., and all of which sort of makes sense. It's, um, it's just seeing the culture uh, of running there. Um, um, the the rural areas where where we work, um, everybody's a runner, and when they're a kid, um, the reason is they have to get to school, and sometimes when they get to, after after school, they have to run home in order to do you know work on the farm, and they don't have time. You know, some of these kids live, I think on average, you know, they live like I don't know, five to ten kilometers away from school through these rocky paths. They don't have shoes. Many of these kids. Um, they um, they just run. It's part of life in this very hilly, high altitude terrain, and um, um, and they're um, uh, they're really good runners because because they have to do it a lot as children, and um, 
but um, but they do it because they have to. And usually, when they get become adults, they stop running, except the ones who are trying to to make it um, um, in the running world. They try to you know try to get a coach, try to get a a, a, a sponsor, try to get um, somebody will take notice of them. And they and and uh, the, the, those some of those people I you know runners I've met are some of the hardest working runners I've ever encountered in my life. They. Um, they they train together in groups. They they use each other to help. There's a very communal thing. They um, um, they run two three times a day. Uh, kind of a punishing regime. They don't have you know Gatorade and goo and gels and and um, fancy shoes. And, um, they don't have um, any of the uh, the uh, the comforts that um, that we have. And they they push themselves really hard. Um, and um, and when people are trying to figure out why the Kenyans are so good at running, um, rarely do I think people factor in that kind of guts and determination and hard work into the equation. I mean, uh, the the um, you know it's a very you know poor area, and, and there's not a lot of jobs, or basically almost no jobs whatsoever. If you don't become a you don't make it winning a marathon, you're a farmer, you know, and um, so the the stakes are huge, and um, and the and the pride and the effort that they put into their running is 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 really impressive. And you know, there's just very few Americans who train like that and grow up like that, and um, and and forego the kinds of comforts that they do. And you know, we we like our comforts, but since when is comfort good for you? Yeah, well, comfort's that's comfortable, true. but comfort doesn't necessarily make you a great runner. And um, and when push comes to shove. You know what is it that makes a gr- you know somebody win a marathon? Well, it's the ability to run with a pack, right? The first 18, 19 miles, and then have gas in the tank to run like hell for the last five, six miles. What gives you that ability? I mean, partly great running form. There may be some genes, though nobody's been able to identify them. Maybe being at high altitude helps, etc. But I think a large component of that, which is very hard to quantify, is just good old-fashioned determination and willpower and and uh, willpower, not just in the in the race, but willpower over those many years beforehand, as you train, um, without any of the the benefits that uh, that their Western counterparts have. How do you quantify those effects? Yeah, that's that's great to think about. It it kind of makes me think about how uh, you know watching if you watched a Kenyan runner finishing a marathon and it, they make it look easy. It makes it looks like it's just a walk in the park. But when you think about it, it's more a case of to them, they've been doing it, working hard, pushing through, you know, that determination you mentioned almost from a child, um, and it's kind of a way of life rather than just, I'm going to go run and push myself hard. You're, you know, you're planning on doing that for that one hour or those few hours, but this is, they do it their whole life, so it's... Well, I mean, yes and no. So the, okay. the running that kids do is not like that. Oh, yeah, no. It's the, once they decide to become a prof- professional runners, mm-hmm. then it's like that. Um, but I, th- I think that they're, you know, it's just as hard for them as it is for us. Yeah. I think it's that they're also good at relaxing. One of the things that I've noticed, so if you, you know, I, uh, I watched, some, you know, the track team here, you know, uh, um, and, um, um, when you watch the track team run by, um, in fact, I saw them on Commonwealth Avenue the other day. They were going opposite directions. This is Harvard seen, you know, 10, 15, team. I'm sorry? This is Harvard track team? Yes, the okay. Harvard track team. So, um, you know, everybody's running a little bit differently. Everybody has a slightly different form, um, and they're not running in sync, etc. When you watch a bunch of Kenyans training together, it's like watching a flock of birds. They all run the same way, hmm. and I think part of that's because there's an, a belief. You, know, you ask people, you talk to them, they believe that there's a right way to run, and and whoever's in, you know they also they follow the lead of the lead runner, right? They run the same stride frequency, and they tr- they run the same way, and and uh, they take turns being leaders. Yeah, it's a different ethos, and um, um, and uh, I think um, uh, I think we, you know, I think we there's much to learn from from those those runners, um, and one of them is how they train, and the other is how they run. Yeah, I could definitely see that. That's uh, amazing to think about. Um, them, you saw them as a flock rather than. Uh, I can. I, I'm just thinking of my personal experience with groups, and yeah, you always talk about there's so many, or we always talk about there's there's so many different running forms. But imagining a group where everyone runs the same because you know they've learned how 
what is considered the best way to run, and that's 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 very interesting to think about. Yeah, it's beautiful to watch, mm-hmm. but you know, think about it, right? If you're, I mean, when you when you see when you go to school and and you see somebody who's doing really well at something, right? You think, okay, yeah, so and so, she's really good at such and such. I'm going to imitate her. Mm-hmm. Why don't we do that for running? Yeah, good point. I mean, I look at a great runner like Jeffrey Mutai, right? And I think, ah, oh, what a great runner. I wish I, I want to run like him, right? Unfortunately, I can't, but um, I would love to, you know, so I'll try, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we have, you know, you, if you see a great swimmer or a tennis player, I mean, you know, try to hit a backhand like Andre Agassi, you know? Why don't we do that for running? We have this idea that's been somehow per- become pervasive that everybody has their own natural running form. I can't think of any other sport where anybody thinks that's true. Is there a natural swimming form? No. Swimming coaches teach you how to swim properly. Golf, tennis, you name it. There's Form matters. And why would that not be true for running? That's just preposterous to, to me. But that is considered dogma by, by a lot of people in the running world. And, um, you know, it's hypothesis has to be tested. But I don't believe it for the, for the, slight, for the slightest. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And you... Um you were one of our uh, speakers for our form running form course, which I will put a link to in the show notes, where you talked about um, how about this running form and how we need to figure out what the best way to run is. And you talked about um, completing a study on the relationship between running form and injury, and that you were currently finishing it up. Is that published? And do you have some findings for that? Well, we've published one paper already, and we're working on another. Okay, it's hard to study. Um, um, uh, there's no simple one f- aspect of form. So um, um, we did show a paper uh, uh, based on the Harvard track team that, that the ones who ran and landed on their heels had higher injury rates than the ones who landed um, on the ball of their foot or the midfoot or forefoot strikers. Okay. Um, and we've done another study, which is a randomized control study, but the sample sizes are small and it's a preliminary study. And we're still um, we're still analyzing those results. So. Uh, I, you know, until we, until we finish them and publish them, I think I should probably uh, stay quiet. But, <laughs> but, but you know, there's not going to be any one definitive study. It's not simple. There's no one aspect of running form. Um, it's okay. something that, you know, we it's going to take years and years of research. Um, but it's good that people are doing it. So there's been a, a few studies that have come out recently about cadence, right? So running at a high stride frequency. Uh, there's been, um, you know, interest in posture. There's been interest in, in overstriding. I mean. You know, I think that um, if there is one, any one benefit that um, uh, from this uh, the paper that we published on forefoot striking is that I think we've refocused attention on running form. Um, and although some people want to kill me for it, um, I um, I stand by. I, I, you know, I don't think that that how you strike is the only thing that has to do with running form. And I think you can run, and we've said it in print that you know you can heel strike and be okay. Um, but I think that. Uh, you know how you strike the ground is part of a suite of issues that uh, that are related to good form. Um, I'm not sure that what you should try to do is forefoot strike. I think if you have good running form, you probably will end up forefoot striking, striking mm-hmm. uh, for the most part, or midfoot striking, or, or if you do rear foot strike, you won't strike rear foot strike hard. Um, but I think it's complicated, and I don't have a simple pat answer yet. Sorry. So if you could give you you may not be able to answer this. If you could give one thing for our listeners to work on. What would you, what would that be? Oh gosh! Well, look, I mean, I think most coaches already can tell you what to do. And I, Someone who doesn't, I, who I, wouldn't you have folks a coach. Runners anyway. connect. I mean, I, I know Jeff. Ben, I mean, you know, I think that I think most people agree that good running form involves good posture, right? Mm-hmm. So don't lean too far, especially at the hips. Yeah. You know, keep up a high cadence. You should be at least 170 steps a minute, um, probably. Um, there's no magic number, so you know, 180 is not perfect. You should land quietly. You shouldn't be Tight and clenched up, you shouldn't. Um, you should get good knee ex- knee flexion, right? Not 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 throw your leg out in front of you. So um, you should try to land flat. Uh, try to land quietly. Um, um, I don't think any any of what I just said is controversial. Mm-hmm. No, um, good point. Um, I think most people would agree that it's good running for them. And there, you know, some variations here and there. And not everybody's the same. Arm carriage, this, that, the other, but. Um, um, I don't think that's really controversial. No. I think more of the question is what makes that good running form and how do you help people actually do that and how much does that really benefit you and and what other factors are involved in injury. We don't know the answers to most of those questions. 
Mm -hmm. Well, we'll have to keep checking back with you to find out in the future. No, I'm, I'm not sure if I'll have the answers, but I'll, <laughs> we're, we're trying, we're trying. <laughs> well, as you, as you have heard, there is no one set thing that you can do to make. It isn't a case of simple fixes to where you can just pick one thing. So um, as, as a Runners Connect coach, I would highly recommend this injury form course in which Dan is a big part of and you will learn a lot. So um, if you are interested in that, I will put that in the show notes. So make sure you t check that out because you will learn a lot. And um, if you really are interested in your future as a runner and what you can do to prevent injuries, that is probably your best bet. So, Dan, um, just to finish up, I have been asking my guests um, to give me one word to describe what you would like to achieve, do, be in 2015. If you could give me one word, what that would be and why. <laughs> one word. Yep. So, for example, um, we've had uh, variety, we've had love. Um, trying to think of another one just a word that you would like to describe what you would like to do for the year it can be running related or just life I can't think of one word but I can think of a phrase okay we'll let you have I that mean, I mean I, I, I'm, I, I, I love what I do and I, I get um, great pleasure out of it and you know to me um, uh, well maybe the word would be community um, okay. because I, to me what that's really what the running world is about that's what Boston uh, has proven to the world over the last two years um, to me, that's what running has been about for millions of years. Um, you know, I think most of us who enjoy running um, have good friends we run with, and we run in groups, and, and we run to help each other. And, um, um, and I think that's the most important thing, actually, about running um, uh, in many ways. It's, it's a real, it's a, people don't realize, you know, sometimes you go out for a run all by yourself, and it's solitary, and et cetera. But uh, for the most part, it's a very communal thing, and I think... Uh, and if you make it about community, you'll have a lot more fun. Um, and uh, um, and I have to say again, you know, experiences over the last few years in Boston. I mean, just a few days ago, I was out on the marathon course, and you know, everybody's. I mean, this is Boston. Nobody says hello to each other, right? <laughs> Not on Sundays on the marathon course. Everybody's out there. Everybody says hello to absolutely everybody. It's it's part of the community. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know who 99.9% .9 of those people are, but I know why they're out there, and they know why I'm out there, and we're all doing the same thing, trying to run to make the world a better place, and uh, um, and that's why I, uh, and I think runners do that. Yeah, that's wonderful, and it's it's just the kind of thing of where you think about if you if you do a small race where you're running on your own, you're just no one is either in front of you or behind you. There's not many people around. It's never as fun as it is as a race where you go, like Boston or one of the big races where you're surrounded by people because it is, it is that community knowing you're, you're all in that pain together and that's one of the wonderful things about running is no matter what level you are at, you're all going through the same thing. You, you know, you all get to 24 miles and you're thinking, oh, that, <laughs> it's And people help you get, get through to the yeah, end. And, yep. and, and, and last year, uh, anybody who had the, the the privilege of running last year, I mean, the community spirit was so strong last year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't think anybody ran Boston last year without crying at some point. It was uh, it was really a, Special, a, yeah. a, an amazing uh, uh, sort of rejuvenating uh, a day, which was about it was about the community. That's what it was about. Oh yeah, definitely. Are you running Boston this year? Oh, absolutely. Okay, we'll, well, we will be looking out to see how you do. So. Oh um, gosh, well. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so far so good. Everything's going well this year. Having a good time. Okay, well, we'll keep supporting you, and uh, we will look forward to hearing how you get on. But thank you, Dan, for uh, coming on the Run to the Top podcast. We've, I've enjoyed listening to you, and I'm sure our uh, listeners will also have uh, learned a lot throughout this interview. So, thank you very much. My pleasure. And there you have it. Thank you for listening today. I hope you got as much out of this as I did. I know many of you are interested in more of the details behind running, and I hope today's in interview really got you thinking. If you enjoyed listening, I would really appreciate it if you could go leave us a review at iTunes. It's easy to do by going to runnersconnect.net forward slash review, which takes you to a page where you can connect to iTunes. It would really mean a lot to me and help me to improve, other than being a little nervous, which I'm hoping will naturally go away. Thank you in advance. 
You can find all links that we talked about today, including that, Je that video of Jeffrey Mutai finishing the Boston Marathon, and the links to Dan's books, as well as other things we mentioned, at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc47. Until next time, have a great week of running!